Hello everyone, this is Dino Chris from Prehistoric Facts. This is a special episode 119. Now this episode, it, you can call it a redux if you want. It's a dinosaur I've talked about before, and that dinosaur is... Acrocanthosaurus. So you can see the size chart right here of Acrocanthosaurus. Very large theropod dinosaur. Now Acrocanthosaurus, the name means spined, high-spined lizard. So you kind of see how the spines actually kind of be a big part of that. Uh, length is 38 feet long, 1.5 meters. Height, 13.5 feet, 4 meters. Weight, 6 tons, 12,000 pounds. Uh, lived 116 to 110 million years ago in the early Cretaceous. Fossils have been found in Oklahoma, Texas, and there's a possibility in Wyoming. I know there has been rumors or that... Uh, Acrocanthosaurus teeth have also been found in the East Coast, like in Maryland, Washington, D.C. area. But uh, those ha those publications haven't come out yet, I haven't heard of. But if anybody knows, let me know. And uh, paleontologists Stovall and Langston in 1950 have actually found and described Acrocanthosaurus. So they were the first ones to publish uh, Acrocanthosaurus. And as you can see here, here is the map of the United States, and you can see where Texas and Oklahoma are. So here's Texas, here's Oklahoma, Wyoming is up here, and uh, Maryland is right over here, and Washington, D.C. is right there in that red dot. And so Acrocanthosaurus kind of lived in those types of areas. And again, this size chart of Acrocanthosaurus to show you the size of Acrocanthosaurus. And so it is going to be taller than a human being. And uh, it is not as big as Tyrannosaurus Rex, but you get the idea. And uh, here is the uh, skeleton of Acrocanthosaurus. And so this uh, top left corner uh, picture, you could see uh, the skeleton right down here. But then you could see what the holotype actually is and so it is not a complete specimen there is still some vertebrae missing uh some of the parts of the feet are missing and even parts of the tail uh that are missing and so you actually see that the skeleton is pro between 50 to 60 percent complete and uh and this is the specimen in the north carolina state university museum and so this is in north carolina uh, in this museum, and uh, you can see that the Sacrocanthosaurus is a very good looking specimen. But uh, they took a wild guess on what the vertebrae might have looked like, but uh, I can actually give you more information about Acrocanthosaurus. So, Acrocanthosaurus actually belongs into a theropod family called the Allosauridae. So, that would include Allosaurus, Cyanraptor, Uchwanosaurus. And a few others. And it is actually going to be part of the basal carcharodontosaurid uh, family. So when you actually look at it, it is actually in between an allosaurid and a carcharodontosaurid. And so it is a primitive form of a carcharodontosaurus. So it is related to carcharodontosaurus, giganotosaurus, and mapusaurus. The spines on the skeleton are actually mainly used for display only, but to make it possibly look larger uh, for rivals and uh, possibly for the males, uh, possibly were like the feathers of a peacock, you know, to show off to the females. Probably brightly colored uh, spine and could actually uh, show the health, the health, uh, and the health of the animal. Now, the teeth of Acrocanthosaurus are thin and knife-like. They are not going to be like Tyrannosaur teeth. Tyrannosaur teeth tend to actually be thicker and still serrated. And Acrocanthosaurus teeth are serrated, but they are not as strong as Tyrannosaur teeth. But uh, they are still strong enough to actually go through flesh. The arms of Acrocanthosaurus are amongst the biggest in its fam in the family of Allosauridae. So it is actually a, it has very big arms, very well muscled arms, and the jaws acted in a scissor-like action. So they mainly are designed to slice through meat, not to get to the bone, mainly to slice through meat. So here is the arm of Acrocanthosaurus on the top left corner, and so it is very large. This is a this is from a this is actually a picture of a replica of an arm of Acrocanthosaurus from the Black Hills Institute. So and uh, that one costs thousands of dollars, and so 
Uh, just be wary when you're actually buying this. And then here's the skull of Acrocanthosaurus. Now this specimen does have uh, teeth missing on this side. The other side actually has pretty normal amounts of teeth. This side probably has like a disease or a injury that it suffered uh, throughout its life. And this is actually the actual skull. So you can see how the skull is actually almost in kind of a little ragged a little bit. But uh, you can kind of tell this is actually the actual specimen. And so the skeleton again. So here's the huge spines uh, of the name of Acrocanthosaurus. And so that's why it was called High Spine Lizard. And uh, you can see how, I mean, the arms on this on this specimen are kind of pretty low, but uh, I'm guessing that this is possibly what they probably are guessing or what the, how the arms are positioned. Now, you got to remember, the arms are very limited in its movement. It is not going to actually reach out and grasp uh, a lot. The only animals that it's actually going to grasp at is animals smaller than it. It is not going to use their arms for bigger prey animals so just everybody know that the environment uh in where acrocanthosaurus lived it was warm and humid uh flowering plants began to dominate in the cretaceous period flowering plants were actually starting to really become very prominent and so that they would actually almost look like flowers that we see today but they were actually a little bit primitive in design, but you can actually kind of tell them they almost look like flowers today. A lot of flower, lots of ferns and cycads, and uh, no grass, of course. This was turn the time of the dinosaurs, but this is over here. There were no grass. And, of course, other animals that actually lived around there, insects, amphibians, reptiles, and all these reptiles included uh, crocodiles, uh, pterosaurs, and then you got some mammals, and these mammals are pretty small, very shrew-like and came out that night and then other dinosaurs of course dinosaurs were still the dominant uh, life forms on the planet the prey of acrocanthosaurus uh, saur poseidon tenontosaurus sauropelta and astrodon saur poseidon is a sauropod and it is actually in uh, texas it was formerly called paluxysaurus but then they realized that saur poseidon was named first and the bones are very similar to the first holotype specimen vertebrae of Sora Poseidon. And so Sora Poseidon is pretty much found in Texas and Oklahoma and some other parts of the Rocky Mountains and southern states. Tenontosaurus, an uh, iguanodontid-like animal, uh, ver very similar to iguanodon, but smaller, only eight feet tall at the hip. And a Sora Pelta, a armored dinosaur, so it's going to have these uh, spikes sticking out from the shoulder area and also from the sides. A little bit of spike, little bit of uh, spikes sticking out on the tail, but they were actually kind of small. It was almost like Gastonia in a way, but the spikes on the shoulders are kind of conical or cone-shaped. And then Astrodon is another sauropod, not as big as Sauro Poseidon, but it is actually a very considered prey item for for uh, Acrocanthosaurus. And so here's a picture of Sora Poseidon on the top left corner. You can see how large this thing is. Acrocanthosaurus will most likely be going after the juveniles or not fully grown ones yet. Because those would actually be the ones that it would be going after. It would not take down a full healthy adult. Because the adults are going to be too tricky to take down. And then on the bottom picture right there, that's Tenontosaurus. So you can see how that huge tail this thing has and that is just a remarkable tail so that was probably its main defense i don't have a picture of sora pelta or astrodon those were kind of more difficult to actually find but uh, we do find behavior between sora poseidon and acrocanthosaurus and it was actually in the paluxy river in texas of uh, footprints of sora poseidon and acrocanthosaurus of the predator prey chase it is actually a remarkable uh, set of footprints. Now part of the now part of the footprints has actually been taken into a museum. I believe it's in the Smithsonian or the or the American Museum of Natural History. Uh, somebody let me know in the comments. But uh, you do see the pattern of Acrocanthosaurus chasing uh, the Sora Poseidon and ultimately uh, making an attack. But uh, the the part of the footprints that were showed. Uh, which dinosaur came out on top is in the museum, and so it, it so it's pretty much Acrocanthosaurus took down the Sora Poseidon. 
Now the extinction of Acrocanthosaurus. Around 110 million years ago, climate began to change, so pretty much climate change is pretty much going to be the main cause uh, for Acrocanthosaurus' demise. Sea levels were rising. Uh, the Western Interior Seaway was actually beginning to form, and so that's pretty much when like the like the environment of Acrocanthosaurus disappeared. The big prey died out, so the sauropods were starting to disappear uh, from North America around that time. So Acrocanthosaurus lost all its big prey. The flowering plants were beginning were were becoming more and more dominant uh, in the Cretaceous uh, after 110 million years ago. And so the sauropods couldn't eat uh, a lot of those flowers. Uh, Tenatosaurus could, but ultimately the Tenatosaurus ultimately started to uh, become part of the Hadrosaur family. And so that's why Iguanodontids ultimately became the Hadrosaurs uh, in the late Cretaceous. And then smaller intelligent dinosaurs were actually starting to come around. And so like your Dromaeosaurs, Deinonychus did actually live alongside uh, Acrocanthosaurus. But, but even though we can actually say that the Dromaeosaurs came out on top uh, at around 110 million years ago, it's because they were smarter. They can adapt very well. And, uh, but it wasn't, a, but Tyrannosaurus didn't start coming into North America around around between 190 million years ago. Uh, and so Tyrannosaurus didn't really actually start coming around until between 100 to 90 million years ago. Uh, but uh, but even though those, those but the Tyrannosaurus were still kind of small, but uh, you can actually tell that, but when you actually think about it, uh, when you actually look at the Carcarodontosaur brains and Allosaur brains compared to Dromaeosaur and Tyrannosaur brains, uh, Tyrannosaur and Dromaeosaur brains are much larger than the Allosauridae family uh, brains. And that's because Tyrannosaurs and Dromaeosaurs can adapt very well. And so here is a world map. Uh, this is actually 120 million years ago, but this is actually very similar to the uh, world that Acrocanthosaurus lived in. And so you can kind of see around here, North America, the Western Interior Seaway is starting to form. Uh, Europe is already, Eurasia has already started to depart away from North America. Uh, South America and Africa are still connected. Uh, India just broke away from Antarctica and Australia is still connected to uh, Antarctica as well. And so you can kind of see how that goes. Then the next episode on October 4th, 2018, will be a Q&A episode. So if you got any questions about dinosaurs or any other prehistoric life, feel free to email me at dinochris71 at gmail.com or just go on my Facebook page, Prehistoric Facts of Dino Chris. Like the page, you get your posted questions on the wall or on the Facebook or on the comment section. But remember, keep your questions short to the point. You could also follow me on Twitter at C-S-G-R-A-L-L. -L. That's my Twitter page. I post pretty cool stuff on there. And also take care of the people around you. And also for younger people out there to make sure to listen to your parents, your teachers, and your guardians. It's the best motivation you could have for good education. It's very important to have a good education with a good education. Get a good job in the future. That's it for now. And I'll see you guys next time.